Good morning. Welcome to the International Connection. And it's a very special show this morning. This is the beginning of a journey we're about to take on this program. A journey into a gruesome world of mind control experiments by government finance doctors in Canada and the United States. Inhuman experiments performed on humans, children for the most part. For the next eight months, on the International Connection, we will be airing interviews with survivors of mind control experiments and ritual abuse, lectures and interviews with therapists, researchers, and writers who are dealing with the legacy of mind control. Specifically, we'll be looking at the documented history of U.S. CIA and military mind control experimental programs, also the struggles of survivors to get compensation from the CIA and Canadian government in particular for the government-funded mind control experiments at McGill University under Dr. Ewan Cameron. We'll be hearing the accounts of survivors of horrific experiments involving electroshock drugs, brain implants, sensory deprivation, psychic driving, forced sleep, ritual and sexual abuse. We'll also be discussing the mil military and intelligence uses of mind control, in including theft, assassination and sexual blackmail using the child victims. We'll be talking about the use of creating multiple personality disorder in people for mind control purposes and its links to the multiple personality effects of ritual abuse. We'll be discussing with therapists, talking about the effects of severe trauma, sexual abuse, recovered memories, and the false memory syndrome. Many people listening may be aware of Dr. Kamen's projects at the Allen Memorial Institute in Montreal, but this wasn't the only location. The experimental projects were carried out all across Canada and, of course, in the United States as well. The first segment of this radio series, Mind Control in Canada, features a lecture by Dr. Colin Ross to his colleagues about the history of the U.S. CIA and military mind control programs. Dr. Ross is a Canadian psychiatrist specializing in multiple personality disorder, currently practicing in Texas. He has researched this subject for many years and is currently writing a book about mind control. He has obtained thousands of CIA documents through the Freedom of Information Act, and through these documents, Dr. Ross is able to prove the U.S. government has been using MPD and Manchurian candidates operationally since World War II, and it doesn't stop there. This lecture is part one of a three one-hour segment to kick off this radio series, Mind Control in Canada, on 88.1 CKLN. And now to Dr. Colin Ross. So why am I uh, talking about this and what is it that I'm going to try and say here? Well, one explanation is nobody has the faintest idea what I'm talking about and I'm here talking about it because I'm a little wacky. Hopefully by the end of the day that will be the conclusion. However, that is a conclusion that's been unhappily in print in various uh, esteemed locations such as British Journal of Psychiatry, Esquire magazine, uh, Richard Offshee's book, Canadian Broadcasting Corporation film. So it's been a very curious experience to go through this little journey that Kevin just alluded to, which is the same journey as we've all gone through who've heard anything about this from patients. And it starts off back in the remote past in 1981-85 when I'm a resident. And I mentioned yesterday that in four years of medical school, four years of residency training, I had more multiple choice questions on lesh nyan syndrome, which just to remind you, as you all know, is an inherited deficiency of hypoxanthine guanine phosphovarbazole transferase. <laughs> I had more questions on that syndrome in my four years of medical school and four years of psychiatry than on childhood sexual abuse. And more teaching. So then somewhere in the course of the residency, I kind of get up to speed on dissociative disorders and connect them to child abuse and read the literature, get a little bit grounded. The avalanche of MPD cases starts for me um, late 85 into 86. And I think I've kind of a little bit got what's going on. And some person comes in and starts telling me about their father was killed by the mafia and they were taken to a mafia a child prostitution brothel and then they were involved in satanic ritual stuff. So I go, gee, no books, no literature, nobody's ever heard of it, nobody talks about it, totally in outer space, no idea what to do or which way to turn. I go to the Eastern Regional Conference, go to Chicago, find out a little bit, start getting a little bit grounded. And... The first couple of cases, my personal reaction is, Gah, this sounds real, sure sounds real, could be real, it's pretty scary, wonder if I should let my kids out on Halloween or not. And then the sort of basic experience is, 
whatever percentage of satanic ritual abuse is actually real, it's clear that we got into some great big hysteria wave in society in general and in the profession. And a lot of people went a bridge or two too far on their journey, and we had to rein ourselves back in. So the, the time course now is, in my training, there's no sexual abuse at all. It doesn't exist. It's not relevant because it doesn't exist. Then it goes to, well, it exists, but it's not really all that relevant. And then there's this sort of outlier gadfly people are into dissociative disorders who aren't accepted by the mainstream. Then those dissociative disorders people, from a foundation of reality that was hidden, go off into outer space on this, uh, wasn't alien abductions, but was still outer space, satanic ritual abuse stuff. Then they sort of come back to Earth and get a little bit grounded. And next thing you know, it's all this government experiments, mind control stuff. So if you follow the pattern, what should be the case is, is just another hysteria wave. And the more you look into it, the more it'll just dissolve and we'll all settle down and we'll forget about it. Well, the pattern didn't work. Because when I started systematically looking into CIA military mind control, the more I looked, the more solid reality there was there. And as you'll see, if we go through these slides and go through this talk, it's a completely different deal from satanic ritual abuse. Somewhere out there in the justice system, there may actually be objective evidence where somebody's actually busted a satanic ritual abuse cult. If there is, that information is not generally publicly available to any of us. It is a fact that we have not nailed down the existence of human sacrifice cults in North America if they exist. So it's all conjecture. Today I will prove to you, completely locked down, documented, proven, beyond dispute or discussion, that intelligence agencies have been creating Manchurian candidates and multiple personality disorder for operational use since the Second World War. This is not a conspiracy theory, this is a fact. Now that's very amazing because if you took an opinion poll of all the psychiatrists in the American Psychiatric Association today, or you took the same poll five years ago, 99.99, there'd be maybe two outlier psychiatrists in the whole group who would say it's possible that Manchurian candidates are real. I mean, over 99% of psychiatrists would say it's fiction. We know the movie is fiction. Frank Sinatra did a good job. But there's just no way. It's absolutely impossible. This is a very, very, very strange phenomena that actually, this is in now in 1996, a completely documented fact. Uh, it's a very strange sociological little development in the field of psychiatry. How could that be possible? Well, I'm going to try and explain how it's possible today. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Also, I'm going to talk about not just creating Manchurian candidates, but the whole network of mind control doctors that's involved in this and supports this, and this kind of old boy network that maintains all of this. And you'll see a whole bunch of slides with godzillion interconnections between them that I'll go into in detail. And every one of those steps, unless I otherwise specify, every one of those steps is completely documented, absolutely objective and full. So there's something real peculiar about just the whole story. It's a very strange story. It tells us that there's something going on in our culture and in the mental health field that is hidden and secret. This is another kind of incest secret in the field of psychiatry that all of these people who have been running psychiatry in the latter part of the 20th century are either directly or loosely connected in to a whole huge universe of covert, hidden, secretly funded mind control research. That, as I emphasized, that's a fact. Now, why should we be talking about that at this conference? Well, it's obvious. If, in fact, experimental multiple personality disorder has been created and has been tight and hard and real enough for operational use by intelligence agencies for the last 50 years, this is something of interest to the dissociative disorders field. This is profound evidence in favor of the iatrogenic pathway to dissociative identity disorder that I talked about this morning. When I combine the expert witness experience I've had a clinically created iatrogenic DID using the techniques of destructive psychotherapy cults and course of persuasion, as I described this morning, when I take that expert witness evidence and see those cases created out of a base of no pre-existing dissociative disorder, and then I go to this CIA military mind control literature, my only possible conclusion is, yes, you can create full tilt DID artificially from ground zero. Also, I have to conclude that you can create 
any degree, complexity, permutation, combination of false memories you want. There is absolutely no limit on the quantity, complexity, reality, congruence, plausibility of false memories that you can insert in somebody's mind, wittingly or unwittingly. So they didn't tell me that in medical school. So this is a little sub-paradigm revolution in the dissociative disorders field. There's a huge wealth of information, experimental information, clinical anecdotal information, and operational street smarts knowledge of dissociative disorders that's been up and running and present full tilt in the mental health field for 50 years now. This did not spring out of nowhere in 1980. And we are missing a ton of experimental research data that's still classified that bears directly on this false memory debate that's going on in our society now. And you'll see some of the players in this, this uh, whole scenario are interesting people. We could put the slide projector on. What I'm going to do is run through a few slides now. There's a series of slides now, then we're going to stop and I'm going to read some passages and then we'll go back into the slides. Every slide that I will show you is in your handout packet so you don't have to take notes on that information. Anybody who's listening to the tape, there's also a few examples of the documentation uh, in your materials after the slides. Anybody who has ordered the tape and wants to get that information can call me at Charter Hospital in Dallas at 1-800-255. 3312 and we can just mail that to you. So the first point, I'm just going to zip through these slides kind of quickly. The first point is that there are a lot of documented declassified mind control research programs that are completely objectively proven. They're beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I have a lot of this material and some of it I have on order. So the first, this is CIA now, uh, Bluebird and Artichoke were two programs that ran from 1951 to 53. And I'll read you some stuff from Artichoke in a minute. MK, these were then rolled over into MK Ultra, which ran from 1953 to 1963. And then there's 149 sub-projects that you'll see in a listing of in a second. That then was administratively rolled over into MK Search, which ran up till 1973. Uh, contiguously with that, and in collaboration with uh, Edgeware Arsenal, MK Naomi, which involves uh, MK Ultra and Artichoke and Bluebird type research done uh, abroad and nationally ran from 1953 to 1970. And this in all involves all kinds of hallucinogens and hypnosis and so on that I'll go into in detail. Stargate is um, just recently declassified ESP paranormal remote viewing, uh, military uses of telekinesis type research that was done from an uncertain start date up until 1984. Bill Gates, former director of the CIA, on uh, ABC's uh, Dateline in December 95, said that it ran up till 1984. They had one of the academic contractors to Stargate on the show, and they had the man whose job was CIA oversight of military experimentation under Stargate. So this really went on. They really used psychics operationally, and they believed in enough to keep spending millions of dollars on it for several decades, probably. Now, when you uh, read all the Senate materials and from the 70s and read all the existing literature, the claim of the intelligence community is that all of this mind control research stopped in 1973 due to uh, Senate oversight and so on. One of the uh, MK Ultra sub-projects is on the paranormal, ESP and using ESP for covert operations purposes. That element of MK Ultra didn't stop in 1973. We now know from the CIA itself that it ran on until 1984. So we know for a fact that at least that element of this mind control research program that was said to have stopped in 73 continued to 84. And my position is that it's simply implausible that this stuff isn't ongoing up to the present. You'll see from this list, Project Chatter, Project Often, Darby Hat, Third Chance, Chickwit, MK Delta, and QK Hilltop, that there was a large number of different programs in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, all of which uh, have just a little tidbit of information about them. Most of the actual documents and so on, uh, nobody's either reviewed and nobody's obtained through the Freedom of Information Act yet. So this is a huge amount of as yet still classified information. Okay, now I'm just going to give you kind of a, a smattering run through of the institutions that were sites for MKUltra research. So MKUltra, there was 149 different sub-projects in MKUltra. And 
those were not in obscure little corners of the world. See, there's American Psychological Association. This is a Butler Hospital and Health Center as part of uh, Harvard. Children's International Summer Villages is a very charming place. This was a project involving a study of children at an international summer camp, age 11. And the study was to determine how children who don't share a common language communicate. And in the CIA materials, it states that the investigator was unwitting of the fact that it was CIA funding. And the purpose of the CIA interest in these 11-year-olds was that they might possibly identify promising uh, young foreign nationals for future use by the agency. Columbia University, Cornell, Denver, Emory, Florida, George Washington, Harvard. Let's just give you a feel for who's involved in this stuff. Houston, Illinois, Indiana University's Johns Hopkins, Eli Lilly was the big supplier of LSD to the CIA. Those of you who uh, can remember the 60s, remember the House of the Rising Sun by the British rock group The Animals? They had a song called A Girl Named Sandoz. Sandoz was the employer of Hoffman, who uh, discovered LSD in the 1940s. Sandoz was the original supplier of uh, LSD to the CIA and the military in the 1950s. And they wanted to secure American supply, so they contracted with Eli Lilly to become the developer. Uh, University of Minnesota, New Jersey Reformatory of Bordentown, you're going to see it a bunch of times on subsequent slides. Ohio, you know, University of Pennsylvania, Penn State, Princeton, Stanford, a couple of universities in Texas, Wisconsin, the Bureau of Narcotics, a prison, a narcotics farm. So these contracts, uh, McGill, NIH, NIMH, National Philosophical Society, everybody gets in on the act a little, NRC. So these were all of the major players in North American psychiatry and psychology who were receiving this kind of funding. Uh, Office of Naval Research, which is you're going to see multiple times on the slide. Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology, all kinds of different agencies and groups. MK Search is the one that MK Ultra was rolled into, ran from 63 to 73, again, Bureau of Narcotics. New Jersey Neuropsychiatric, which was also an MK Ultra site, and I'll talk about more detail. Vacaville State Prison, you're going to hear a whole bunch about. Now, Bluebird and Artichoke, which were 51 to 53, institutions there include Bureau of Narcotics, Cornell, Eli Lilly again, NIH, Public Health Service, University of Minnesota. So you get the idea. Now, what about the, the proven identity of some of the actual contractors? The terminology here is we've got the contractor, then we've got the subproject number, and I have uh, most of these, I actually have the subcontract files. And security status mean, TS means top secret, cleared, and UW means unwitting, because this money was usually put through a funding fund, uh, and you'll see a slide on all the way that was all organized. So the person could get CIA money through the funding front and genuinely not know that it was CIA money. We just think it was another foundation. Most of these people you haven't heard of, like James Hamilton and Harold Abramson and Carl Pfeiffer, but you'll hear more about them later today. But some of these people might sound a little bit familiar. Louis Jolyon West, who's at UCLA. Ewan Cameron, who's was in McGill, has been written about a lot. And uh, yes, this is Carl Rogers of Rogerian psychotherapy fame. He was actually a uh, spook psychiatrist with top secret clearance who was on the advisory board of one of the funding fronts and received funding for psychotherapeutic research on schizophrenia. It's a very funny thing that Mr. Friendly Carl was in network. Uh, Martin Oren, you'll hear a lot about him. These people were at the University of Oklahoma. They were doing research on street gangs. Four of the MK Ultra subprojects were on children, and all of the investigators for those were unwitting. And Martin Oren's top secret clearance status. Maitland Baldwin is a neurosurgeon who did uh, stuff on monkey brains. Uh, George White was a CIA career officer who constructed safe houses in San Francisco and New York where uh, people were recruited in off the street to have sex with prostitutes and were given uh, LSD and other drugs without their knowing it. The rationale for this is that they're attempting to study reaction of unwitting subjects in civilian settings to mind control drugs. An alternative hypothesis is that they were actually testing Manchurian candidate prostitute performance. Uh, 
Uh, Harold Wolf was uh, at Cornell. Raymond Prince, of course, bonded with. He's an unwitting guy who did uh, research amongst the Yoruba in Nigeria on their folk healing practices. Uh, R. Gordon Wasson, I was a little bit unhappy to see him on the list, but relieved to see he was unwitting because I read a book of his called Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality, a long time ago, which is a very interesting book on fly agaric, which is that little red toadstool with the white flakes on it. Called It's technically called Amanita muscaria. And the use of that by circumpolar shamans is very interesting history. Uh, John Mulholland's actually a magician. And when you go through all these documents, all these names are whited out. You've got to piece it together from here and there. and It's a great big story trying to track it all down, except uh, they goofed up. John Mulholland's name was not whited out, whited out once. Yeah, not ascertained, right? When you when you get a file on one of these sub-projects, there's usually a page in there that has standardized wording about uh, no individuals associated with this project are witting or uh, so-and-so whose name is whited out has top secret clearance and is aware of agency involvement. Uh, there's somebody you've probably heard of. His name is B.F. Skinner. I'm still doing some of the archival research to figure out what his sub-project number is and what his security status is, uh, but I would suspect it'll turn out to be top secret. Okay, now just before we get to that slide, I'm going to read you some material, some of which is in your handout. As you can see, these slides are going to show you an awful lot of connections between an awful lot of different things here. But you get the gist of there was a lot of sub-projects, a lot of different investigators all over mainstream academia. Now I'm going to jump to proving to you that multiple personality disorder has been created by the CIA and the military since the Second World War. And the first stop-off point is at the back of your series of handouts there. It's a, a publication called Science Digest, April 1971. The author is G.H. Estabrooks, E-S-T-A-B-R-O-O-K-S, -O -O and the article is called Hypnosis Comes of Age. So when you go to page 48, it is on there. I'm going to read this out loud for benefit of people listening to the tape. He's now writing in 1971, and he says the following. One of the most fascinating but dangerous applications of hypnosis is its use in military intelligence. This is a field with which I'm familiar through formulating guidelines for the techniques used by the United States in two world wars. For those of you who are not history buffs, that means at least back to 1914. Communication in war is always a headache. Codes can be broken. A professional spy may or may not stay by. Your own man may have unquestionable loyalty, but his judgment is always open to question. The hypnotic courier, on the other hand, provides a unique solution. I was involved in preparing many subjects for this work during World War II. One successful case involved an Army Service Corps captain whom we'll call George Smith. Captain Smith had undergone months of training. He was an excellent subject, but did not realize it. I had removed from him by post-hypnotic suggestion all recollection of ever having been hypnotized. First, I had the Service Corps call the captain to Washington and tell him they needed a report on the mechanical equipment of Division X headquartered in Tokyo. Smith was ordered to leave by jet next morning, pick up the report, and return at once. These orders were given him in the waking state. Consciously, that was all he knew, and it was the story he gave his wife and friends. Then I put him under deep hypnosis and gave him, orally, a vital message to be delivered directly on his arrival to J in Japan to a certain colonel. Let's say his name was Brown, of military intelligence. Outside of myself, Colonel Brown was the only person who could hypnotize Captain Smith. This is locking. I performed it by... Uh, I've had patients talk to me about locking. I performed it by saying to the hypnotized captain, until further orders from me, only Colonel Brown and I can hypnotize you. You will use a signal phrase, the moon is clear. Whenever you hear this phrase from Brown or myself, you will pass instantly into deep hypnosis. When Captain Smith is reawakened, he had no was reawakened, he had no conscious memory of what happened in trance. All that he was aware of was that he must head for Tokyo to pick up a division report. On arrival there, Smith reported to Brown, who hypnotized him with a signal phrase. Under hypnosis, Smith delivered my message and received one to bring back. Awakened, he was given the division report and returned home by jet. There I hypnotized him once more with a signal phrase, and he spilled off Brown's answer that had been dutifully tucked away in his unconscious mind. The system is virtually foolproof. As exemplified by this case, the information literally was locked in Smith's unconscious for retrieval by the only two people who knew the combination. The subject had no conscious memory of what happened, so couldn't spill the beans. No one else could hypnotize him, even if they might know the signal phrase. 
Not all applications of hypnotism to military intelligence are as tidy as that. Perhaps, now here he makes a scholarly mistake, because he's talking about Morton Prince's uh, The Dissociation of a Personality, and he refers to the book Three Faces of Eve. Perhaps you have read The Three Faces of Eve. The book was based on a case reported in 1905 by Dr. Morton Prince of Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard. He startled everyone in the field by announcing that he had cured a woman named Beecham of a split personality problem. Using post-hypnotic suggestions to submerge an incompatible childlike facet of the patient, he'd been able to make two other sides of Mrs. Beecham compatible and lump them together in a single cohesive personality. Clinical hypnotists throughout the world jumped on the multiple personality bandwagon as a fascinating frontier. By the 1920s, not only had they learned to apply post-hypnotic suggestion to deal with this weird problem, but also had learned how to split certain complex individuals, very interesting phrase, into multiple personalities like Jekyll Hyde's. The potential for military intelligence has been nightmarish. During World War II, I worked this technique with a vulnerable Marine lieutenant I'll call Jones. Under the watchful eye of Marine intelligence, I split his personality into Jones A and Jones B. Jones A, once a normal working Marine, became entirely different. He talked communist doctrine in minutes. He was welcomed enthusiastically by communist cells, was deliberately given a dishonorable discharge by the Corps, that's called sheep dipping, that's a technical term for that, which was in on the plot and became a card-carrying party member. The Joker was Jones B, the second personality, formerly apparent in the conscious Marine. Under hypnosis, this Jones had been carefully coached by suggestion. Jones B was the deeper personality, knew all the thoughts of Jones A, was a loyal American, and was imprinted to say nothing during conscious phases. All I had to do was hypnotize the whole man, get in touch with Jones B, the loyal American, and I had a pipeline uh, straight into the communist camp. It worked beautifully for months with this subject, but the technique backfired. While there was no way for an enemy to expose Jones's dual personality, they suspected it and played the same trick on us later. Okay, so now the only question becomes is, is Esther Brooks some sort of kook? Maybe he didn't really do this, maybe he's grandiose or delusional or just bullshitting or whatever. So let's take a look at who G.H. Esther Brooks is. How are we going to do that? We're going to talk to a JFK assassination researcher who tells us that Esther Brooks' personal papers are all uh, at Colgate College in Hamilton in Upper State, New York, that there's a whole bunch of boxfuls of all his personal papers, his correspondence and files and so on. So what we'll do is we'll send our secretary up there for five days to go through those 17 boxes, which are unindexed, unresearched and unpublished in any form. And then we'll request a bunch of that material to be photocopied. We'll bring it back to our office in Richardson. We'll look at it and then we'll talk about it in Orange County later on. And what we find is J. Chester Brooks was born in uh, Newfoundland in Canada. So he's always suspect because he's Canadian. <laughs> he's not really uh, too dumb. He's a Rhodes Scholar. He ends up uh, studying, I'm pretty sure, under Gardner Murphy at Harvard, takes a PhD, and uh, spends really his entire adult professional career at this obscure Colgate uh, College in Upper State New York. So is he just an isolated kook, or is he connected in in any way? Well, as I'm going through all this military mind control research in the library, I'm aware that Martin Orne, who we'll get to in a while, is one of the people I really want to focus in on. And I notice in Martin, one of Martin Orne's papers that he's referenced G.H. Brooks' 1943 textbook, which I've read, where he describes creating Manchurian candidates for the military. So I know that Martin Orne's aware of G.H. Chesterbrook's claim to have created multiple personality disorder. Can I establish any better connection than that? Well, lo and behold, I find out that G.H. Chesterbrook's edited a book to which Martin Horn contributed a chapter. Okay, so now Martin Horn is totally connected into the whole picture, as you'll see later. But if you go to uh, a couple of pages ahead of that material I just read, you'll see a letter from G.H. Chesterbrook's dated August 22, 1961. Uh, Dear Martin, I am sending to thee a special delivery, one halo, pure gold, one pair of wings, which you can try on for size, and a credit card for use in the hereafter. Your article is, of course, excellent. Upon receipt of your letter, I immediately called Middendorf, and he informed me before I could even broach the subject that they would, of course, grant your request for reprints. Someday I'm going to have myself examined and find out why I do not consider these matters before I embarrass my friends. By the way, I'll be at the APA meetings Friday and Saturday, September 1st and 2nd. Then I'll have to whip back here and head south. If at all possible, I will be up at the Biltmore. If you and Ron, which is Ron Shore, are anywhere in the vicinity, 
let us sit down and yak at each other. I'm not overlooking the fact that our meeting at Cambridge with yourself and Ron sort of crystallized an idea in my mind. I had a wonderful month's vacation in Canada, Toronto, Ottawa, Quebec City, Murray Bay, St. John, New Brunswick, and home. We particularly like the French country. My wife's native language is French, although she speaks Italian, English, and German as well. I find that with her along, the red carpet is literally rolled out, and we see corners of the back country where they would set the dogs on me if I happened to turn up alone. Thank you tremendously. Hope to see you at the APA. My best regards to Ron. So it seems that these guys knew each other. 